of our lives. You alone are worthy that we would give all to you today. You were the word of the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. You're here.
Thank you. Are you glad to be in the Lord's house? Yeah. Every time I come here, it's looking better, except for a few. <laughs> you always have to deal with that, don't you? Uh, a lot of globe trotters around here. I tell you, this is the traveling this church I know anything about. And everybody's on the move. And that's good. And long distances oftentimes. But it's good to be here again. Always a joy to be in this church and to fellowship with you people. Our spirit, the spirit that we have in this church is, is certainly good. Of course, that's because of the Holy Spirit, right? And His presence and presidency over the congregation. We are going to have the Lord's table today, and what I usually do is go to the book of Matthew, chapter 26, and verse 26. That's easy for me to remember. You can take Luke's account also and others, but I like to have it simple where I can remember Matthew 26, 26. So if you have your Bible, would you locate that portion of God's Word? And uh, we'll just basically go down through this passage and give a few instructions as, as we move along. Uh, the Lord's Supper, to me, is, is a powerful thing. Uh, I'm struck by two things just on the face of it. Uh, and one is the simplicity of it. You know, we, we serve an all-wise, infinite, in wisdom God. He, he knows it all. You can see the vastness and beauty of space and realize the creativity of his mind. He could have saw, uh, thought and, and given us some real technical thing to grab us, uh, but he didn't do that. Uh, he gave us a simple remembrance of him. And by the way, that's what the Lord's table is, is to stir up our pure minds by way of remembrance. It's not, it doesn't save us, doesn't help save us, but it points us to that which made us being saved possible. And so we'll look at it in that way. It's a simple thing. And then also, it's a serious thing. Uh, I, I think when we come to the Lord's Supper, it probably ought to be the most serious time that we have. It's uh, three looks that we see in, in the the Lord's Supper. There's a backward look when we look back to Calvary where He died and shed His blood for our sins on the cross. And then there's an inward look when we examine ourselves. The book of 1 Corinthians 11 tells us at this time we are to examine ourselves. Not examine anybody else. You know, We're, we're good inspectors of other people. I, I've had in times past people come up to me and say, you know, so-and-so didn't bow his head. Well, I wonder how he found that out. <laughs> right? Uh, so that's, that's not what we're... We're not to examine ourselves. We're, I mean, others, we're to examine ourselves. We're to introspect. And that's a, a vitally important thing. And to see whether we're uh, really saved and then if our hearts are right with God. So we examine ourselves. And this, this matter not only uh, is a, a backward look and an inward look, but a forward look. He says we're to do this to show forth the Lord's death until He come. He's coming back one day. And He says, I want you to keep fastened in your mind uh, what is represented in, in the Lord's Supper. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's let's go to Matthew 26, 26. What we'll do just in a moment is we'll have a prayer after I've read the scripture, and then we'll go. I understand is customary uh, for the congregation here. The first row will go over to where you can receive uh, the body and the blood of Christ represented. And uh, go all the way around, come back in, take your place with both elements. And wait for everybody to, to be seated. And then I'll read the passage uh, a step at a time. 
and uh, we'll have prayer after the giving of the bread and then the giving of the two prayers. And I'll call on someone to lead in those prayers. So that should be easy enough. Let's read the passage, 26, 26 through 30. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. I just want to pause and say one thing. I've always been struck by the fact of them singing as they left this place. Now, Jesus knew, in fact, he knew from all eternity what was about to take place. Uh, he's the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. This wasn't coming as a surprise to him. He knew that in just hours, he would be crucified for our sins on the cross. That would have been bad news for some people. But these men uh, realized that's why he came. And he realized it of a surety. And those men, and uh, uh, you know, men's voices aren't usually as beautiful as, as ladies' voices, except men here. But they, they went out singing. I bet it was a beautiful, beautiful sound into the ears of the Heavenly Father as they sang triumphantly, uh, going to Gethsemane and then on to Calvary to shed His blood. Well, let's stand together. Um. <clears throat> I have a really long series of really terrible Christmas jokes. I was going to do I don't think I'll do that now. Yeah, I think I'll put that one aside. Uh, I couldn't find one that was very good, so I decided I'd just do a bunch that were, you know, I thought maybe, you know, safety in numbers. But I, I guess not. My, my. Well, um, I can't see the, the, Nathan? Is Nathan back there? Oh, okay. Um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, I'm not entirely well, but uh, I am very glad to see Jada and Brandon back and that they came straight to church. Wow. Pretty amazing, pretty amazing. I love it, love it. Glad you guys are safe. I was praying for you out there. Uh, so um, all this uh, season we talk about Christmas. There's lots of Christmas things going on. And uh, it was suggested that I do a bit of a Christmas message. And sometimes that's uh, a little challenging. But I started digging into the Christmas story. What I mean by challenging is what can you say about it that is not what everyone already knows? Um, and I'll try not to go too long. Um, I know that's the famous, uh, famous last words of the <laughs> I, I said that once. I was getting up to speak at a Pentecostal church somewhere, and I said, I'm not going to go too long. He said, oh, don't ever, preacher behind me said, don't ever say that. Because you never know when the Spirit's going to hit you, right? But I'll, I'm going to try. Uh, so how did the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, come about? Um, <coughs> I thought we could start at Matthew 1, um, right at the beginning of what, what in our Bibles is called the New Testament. Uh, 
It's uh, right at the, in the very first chapter of the New Testament in Matthew 1, and he starts off uh, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> so right from the beginning, uh, this guy Matthew, this is written by Matthew, who is a Jewish man. And he's telling us right away, right from the get-go, that he thinks this Jesus person is the promised Messiah, the one that the Jews have been waiting for for centuries for deliverance. Oh, thank you. <laughs> A throat lozenge. Yes. So let's just start with his name. There's things we can learn that are pretty interesting about the name of Jesus Christ. First of all, if you think that it's like that's it, Christ is his last name. It's not his last name. Like it was Mary and Joseph Christ, and they had their son Jesus Christ. You know, I mean, I, I don't know. There might be people that think that. Um, uh, the word Christ means uh, is Greek for Messiah or uh, the Anointed One, the one that God has poured into. Uh, Jesus is a Latin translation of a Greek word. And this, uh, the and the Hebrew name Yeshua, and I, I didn't really know there was such a connection between the name of Jesus and this. You might, maybe you guys have heard some people use the word Yeshua before. I it, when I heard that I was like, oh yeah, there are some people that are like real hardcore sticklers about translations, maybe, and they'll say Yeshua, and sometimes maybe you think they're trying to show off or something, <laughs> but uh, but there's so this connection between. The name Joshua, Yeshua is where we get the name Joshua in English. So there's a connection between the name Joshua and the name Jesus. So immediately, this is going to have all kinds of bells and whistles going off for someone in the first century who's Jewish. And they're going to be like, Joshua, uh, let's see, he's the guy, he's the, he's the warrior king. He's the warrior king who brings his people into the promised land, right? So that's a really important thing in the minds of the people of the first century. So uh, Mary is pledged to be married to Joseph. We all know most of this story, I think. Um, uh, she, is, she, you know, she becomes pregnant of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is a very big deal because if you're pregnant out of wedlock, then... You know, I mean, you're going to be banished if you're lucky, maybe stoned if you're not, right? This is a really serious, serious thing. Uh, let's read in verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary, this is Matthew 1, after his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. So he didn't want to shame her. Uh, I think you can really infer from this that he loved her. And it, it just, it must have been so freaky, right? Just put yourself in that place, in the place of Joseph and Mary. I mean, what, talk about what are people going to think? You know how driven we are by what are people, what are people going to think? I mean, now what are people going to think? And I've had this whole, you know, wedding planned. You know, there's this whole thing that's all on the line. And then probably for Joseph, it's just like, oh, now I can't marry her. Now it's, it's over, you know, but I don't want to be mean about it, right? So he's, while he's thinking about it, one night while he's sleeping, he's trying to decide what he's, how he's going to handle this situation. Um, an angel comes to him in a dream. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, so, which is very important to us as Christians. Uh, and don't be afraid about your reputation. Don't be afraid about whatever's going to happen. And I've had a lot of things. I, I don't know if you guys have in your lives um, had things happen where God gave me a word and it was <clears throat> challenging, to say the least. It was like maybe my reputation 
was at stake. What are people going to think if I do this crazy thing? I don't know if anybody can relate to that today, but I can certainly relate to Joseph and the Lord coming and giving him a word that then calms him, uh, you know, through this terrible ordeal because they're in this small town. Probably everybody in the community knows what's going on. And, and sometimes we're in these situations where there's no way out. I mean, that would be a no way out situation. How She's pregnant. There's no way out of that, right? Uh, she hasn't been with a man. She says, uh, I believe her. I, I, what, you know, there's, how can God take this thing? And he's telling me it's going to be great. I've blessed it, right? But I can, I, can you see the challenge of that? It's like, oh, well, okay. But he keeps his promises, doesn't it? So he's, he's so great the way... I've had many different situations since I've been walking with the Lord that I thought, you know, man, this is, this is a tough place. There's no way this can turn out good. I cannot see any way that this is going to be beneficial. Have you been in situations like that? I thought, I just cannot see it. How is this going to, how can this be redeemed? Right? Of course, we know, we know the end of the story. So we know, oh, Mary, you've been given a name among you know, how is it, high among women or above? You know, I mean, obviously this is a blessed thing that's happening. We know that. One thing that's interesting is the virgin birth itself, it wasn't really necessary uh, from the Jewish perspective, let me say. Because keep in mind, Matthew is writing to Jews. So uh, <coughs> in a way that Paul was writing to the Gentiles, so you know how who you're writing to changes kind of how you'll say things or what's important. This term virgin that we, you get from uh, Isaiah, you know, a child shall be given, a virgin shall conceive. Uh, in the Jewish language, that just, it could mean just a young woman, a maiden. It doesn't necessarily mean a virgin, you know, like the, a virgin birth, like, the, like it means in this context. And no one was really expecting this. This is not really something, you know, the Messiah coming, the things that were critical about the Messiah, he had to be from the line of David, you know, and he's the one that's going to bring in the messianic age. They're looking for a savior with a sword. They're looking for someone to bring them out of oppression. And then, and basically, from the Jewish people that I've talked to, it's like, well, yeah, when somebody comes and does that, then we'll go, oh, that's him. So that, that was the proof that they needed. A virgin birth was like, huh? So why is it in there? It almost makes it less believable or something. And I think the, the answer, uh, the only answer that makes sense to me is that it's true. Why else? Would it, it doesn't, it's not in there to support their case. Okay, so then the angel says, and she will bring forth a son. That's Mary. She will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And so immediately he's like, Jesus, Joshua, or Yeshua, right? It would have been. Joshua, the warrior king. Wow, wow, the warrior king's coming from this situation, from Mary and and, and then the angel says, for he will save his people from, and, and, and sure, Joseph's thinking, oh, you don't have to tell me what he's going to save his people from. We know. We've known for centuries. We've been waiting for centuries. In fact, we're about ready to give up. I mean, how many, imagine waiting for a promise from God for centuries. Most of us give up after like, you know, a week, right? Well, I guess God's not answering that prayer. I'm, I'm on. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I was so impressed when I heard Elijah's dad's testimony about their their uh, adoption of Carnet because they faced just obstacle after obstacle and you know over all this time and they just pressed on through and I mean it's an incredible testimony you know and I thought with my wife and I it's like we'd hit the first obstacle and we go well I guess it wasn't God's will <laughs> but we know they. Joseph knows what, the, what that means, that the Messiah is coming, that Joshua is coming, right, to save his people from their sins? 
uh, hey, Angel, I don't, uh, that's not really a felt need. That's not really what, that's not what we're looking for here. You were looking for the Savior with the sword. We're looking, the, we, we got to conquer the Romans. We got to kill the bad guys. Sins? But the, I, that's not even on our list of needs. Well, okay, our first need is physical, right? We need food. We need water, right? That's the first need. Second need would be, what, safety, maybe? Safe, safety, second. We need, we want to be safe and then third might be like love and community and things. And then fourth might be like self and self-image. But I mean, sins isn't even on the list, right? I'm what, save his people from their sins. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, that's not really a, something that we're really concerned about. And besides, we've got a whole sin system. We've got a whole system to work all that stuff out. We're, we've already got the temp. we got the temple, We've got a way to handle every single sin imaginable, right? Every sin, okay, well, for this sin, you do this, and for this sin, you sacrifice that. And, you know, we've got that sorted out, Angel. Can you, you got anything else? <laughs> you know who needs saving? Rome needs saving. The other guy needs saving. Rome needs saving, right? Isn't that all how we always are? It's like, listen, I'll, you know, I, you, m- m- my sins are okay, but you know, the, the Democrats, we need to take care of the Democrats, right? We need to take care of the Republicans. We need to take care of the bad guys, whatever they are, whoever they are, right? That's what we're really concerned about. But Joseph did not respond that way. Joseph didn't respond that way at all. And I, I think it's because he knew it was God. He knew he, you know, he heard from the angel of God in the dream. If you hear and you you hear from God, an angel of God, and you know it was him, oh man, I mean that's gonna rock your world. That's it's like oh, oh okay. I mean I think in a way if we if God showed up here today, like for real, and we all knew it was him, and he gave us some command, would you think? We would just like go like, oh, we're not going to do it. I think it would take, it, in a way, it almost takes away choice. It almost takes away free will. Uh, you know, uh, I think that's why God hides himself a lot of times. Because if he just showed up and it, it's like, man, we'd have no problem falling on our knees. It's kind of like if you put your hand in a fire, if your free will said, okay, I'm going to put my hand in this fire. The pain is after a while going to be like, okay, it, the pain is going to trump free will. Right, so the majesty of God. I don't think any of us are going to do that, and Joseph did not. Also, he he did what God told him to do. Now, you know the reason why most of us are not moved by the idea of the Messiah coming to save us from sin. Two thousand years later, most of us are not really that excited about being saved from our sins. Uh, we don't really light up so much at this idea, and. I think there's a couple different reasons. I think one of them is we don't really understand what sin means. Uh, I think <laughs> it's a, it comes from an old archery term to, me, to miss the mark of, of to miss the mark of what you were created to be, really. So anything that is is getting in the way of you being the God person, the person that God created you to be, that's sin. So, you know, I don't know, for example, uh, for most of us, it's not, it wouldn't be a sin for us to not go into the wilderness and fast for 40 days. But for Jesus, it would have been, or you, you see what I mean? It, what, whatever your calling is, whatever God's calling you to, then for you to not do that is sin. So that's part of it. Also, also, it is the things that hurt. You know, I, I, I don't think we understand that. Um, I don't think we really understand the scripture about the connection between sin and death. You know, the wages of sin is death. That, I, I think we misunderstand that and think, oh, God's going to kill you if you, you know, uh, if you cheat on your taxes, then God's going to kill you. You know, there's going to be this physical consequence. But I don't think that's what it means uh, the wages of sin being death is that sin brings death in some way to everything 
that it's involved with. In in here's what I mean. Um, like if you uh, if you're dishonest with somebody, it's going to bring death to that relationship. If if you're if you are not faithful in your marriage, right? I mean, how many people have been affected by the death that sin causes, right? Um, in all kinds of ways. I mean, there's all kinds of different things that we could talk about, and we don't always realize that that's what's going on. When I was living my life of sin, I was just kind of doing things that I thought were fun, and then I wound up in a place of death and wreaking death and not even really knowing it. And the consequences go on for years. Some of you are nodding, go, you understand what this is talking about. It's talking about the death of families, the death of vitality. The, the, people can't even look in the mirror at themselves because they're so ashamed. The death of your relationship with yourself, so to speak. So to be delivered from that, right? It's, it's deeper than, oh, he's gonna, uh, you know, uh, most of us think of Christmas as being, oh, God gave us the gift of his son so we can get forgiveness of sins. We got forgiveness of sins, which is great. I don't want to downplay that idea because forgiveness is huge, but the gospel is much bigger. It's much bigger than that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> we'll think, oh, he's, so Jesus comes to forgive, forgive us of our sins and that he'll save us from the penalty and the consequences of sin. And that's not really true either. Um, prisons are full of people that are still suffering the consequences of sin and they've been forgiven, but the consequences go on, Right? So what is Christmas all about? What is this gift that we sing about? Jesus came to deliver us from the power of sin. Right? He comes as Joshua with the spirit of a victorious warrior. Right? To deliver us from the power of it. So we're no longer... We sing about it, but do we really believe it? We're no longer slaves, right? We're, we have a different master now. He came to deliver us from the power of sin. He came in the spirit of Joshua, the war who frees us from the kingdom of, from the dominion of, from the power of sin, which is a different thing, which is something that I think we ought to be more excited about. I, I, I know that we're not that excited about it. <laughs> but we ought to be much more, because this is the killer thing. So, okay, I'm a drunk guy on the floor of a hotel room, right? Room spinning. You know, Jesus doesn't come and just say, I forgive you, right? He brings, but not, not all at once, a lot of the time, but as we walk with him, he brings us out of the life that we were in. He brings it. We're no longer subject to. <laughs> we're subject. We have, we have a new master, right? He sets us free from these things. That's, and that, isn't that what people testify about? They, they get up and say, yeah, oh man, and my life was going this way and I was struggling with this addiction. I was struggling with this thing and I gave my life to Jesus and now I'm free from this thing. And everyone goes, yay, yes. But think about him being the warrior, the spiritual warrior behind the scenes that's actually doing that. Wow. I saw this video a long time ago. It was, some of you may have seen it and it, and had this teenage girl. It was like an artistic play that they did at Christmas time, I think. And and she was in this kind of um, 
what was it? They didn't speak. They were acting out all these things without speaking. And she was getting in a bad crowd, and and you could see that they were acting it out. And 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 then there was this bad guy and this thing and this other thing, and it was all coming against. It. And then they were all kind of hanging on her and dragging her down. And she's like this with all these guy, all these guys on her. And then the Jesus character comes and starts, you know. Pulling all those he and pulling all those guys off of her and on to him. Like he holds them all back. And it was such a great, such a beautiful display of what is really happening here and what it means that his name shall be called Jesus and he shall save his people from their sins. Hallelujah. Praise God. The Apostle Paul picks up on this later and he says in Romans 6 12 therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body mortal body so that you will obey its evil desires do not even offer part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness For sin shall no longer be your master. You got a new master. There's a new sheriff in town, right? She will no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but you are under grace. Hallelujah. Through Christ, you're given a new master. Not the law of God, but the Spirit of God in you. You know, is the Spirit of God tempted? Is the Spirit of God angry? Are you struggling with anger? Spirit of God isn't angry, right? (laughs) Whatever it is that you are struggling with, you can be delivered. Accept his sacrifice and be delivered. Be delivered. Let Let him do his miraculous work in your life this Christmas season. Yes. Hallelujah. So, you know, a lot of us, our Christian life is kind of the best it gets is this forgive, the forgiveness thing. So it's like sin, forgiveness, sin, forgiveness. That's just like kind of the pattern that some of us have lived in. And I just invite you to step into this new master thing that alcohol will not be your master. Does not have to be your master anymore. Anger, drugs, jealousy, lack of self-control, laziness, bitterness. Doesn't have to be your master anymore. Right? Yeah. Every morning, every morning, man, let's get up and say, Lord, I give you my hands. I give you my feet. I give you my mind. Give me new thoughts today, Lord. You know he can change your thinking. He can change your heart. He can change, he can take the the hostility that you have towards others or towards somebody specifically. Lord, if you give it to him, it's amazing what he will do if we will just give it to him like every day and say, Lord, I'm sin is no longer my master you are my master and I claim it today and use me don't let anything happen today don't let a word come out of my mouth that isn't your word Lord yeah so Christmas is a standing invitation from your father to be delivered from yourself hallelujah so if you're not ready for that today you know when you get ready, when you get fed up, sometimes it takes some time. It can take some time. I remember early on in my walk, a lot of really good stuff was happening in the spirit and the place was dancing and shouting. And I was just kind of standing there and a lady came over and said, hey, you, can I pray for you? You want some of this? And I was like, no, no, I'm not ready. And she said, okay. I said, thanks. <laughs> I was glad. I was glad she didn't, you know, I was, I was glad she didn't like make me feel, you know, guilty or something. I thought that showed good, good discernment because I think it was true. I wasn't ready. You know, 
we have this time. Everybody's got a time. We're like going this way. God's going, you know, God's got a place out there where he's going to meet. He's going to meet you. <laughs> yeah, I hope it's today, but if it isn't today, if it's whenever it is your time, we want to be there praying for you. We're praying for you. We're with you. We want you to know that the Lord is for you always. And this great gift of this new master, this loving master, filled with love and joy and all the things that we truly desire, it's all, it's all yours. I was thinking about the phrase as I was ta- thinking about this, about the, how we talk about him being the light of the world. Well, okay, so Jesus doesn't come to you in your darkness and say, I forgive you for the darkness. He does, but he also brings you into the light and he takes that darkness and turns it into light, right? He takes the, all the depression and all the stuff that I was in and he's, he's miraculously used it in the same way he uses this terrible thing that happens with Joseph and Mary. He uses terrible things. Jesus going to the cross was a terrible thing. He'll take terrible things and use it in the most miraculous way that you can't see today probably. We are very, very short-sighted. But he'll do it. He will do it. He will use it for his glory. And you'll, you will be on the mountaintop when those things happen. You'll like, it'll be like, wow. There was a purpose in all of that suffering. Because when God uses it, it's like it is. It's like the woman, <laughs> the woman after having a baby. I only laugh because there was one time when I used this analogy. I said, you know, a woman forgets all about all that pain after she has the baby. And one woman yelled out, no, she don't. <laughs> but you, you get, a, get what I'm saying. It's like the joy of that is so great that you, it will no longer bother you. So... You are to give him his name, the name of Jesus, which is likened to Joshua, our victorious warrior who will fight for you. He wants to fight for you. Man, I think that's exciting because he will deliver his people from their sin. Hallelujah. Glory to God.